when the uh, Electret microphone gained traction through uh, Sony and other companies that decided to produce it, um, or, or it was being integrated into to telecommunications. And during that process, I began to be known as the first black man to make a substantial contributions to telecommunications. Um, you know, it's all right to be first, but, but it's a little bit dangerous uh, to be first also. And, um, and I um, was reluctant to accept that first. And so mm -hmm. I began to look at, um, at other black inventors uh, of, uh, that, that I could find. And I, I went to the Schoenberg in New York City, which is about, I think, the best library on black culture and, and contributions. And there I found an inventor by the name of Granville T. Woods. Mm -hmm. And what made Granville T. Woods so important to me, at least, in my technology, is that he had a patent on what was called the carbon transmitter. And mm -hmm. A.G. Bell purchased Granville T. Woods' patent. Mm -hmm. And the carbon microphone was the first mass-produced microphone in telephony, mm -hmm. only to be replaced by the electret microphone. So uh, he became my hero because it let me off the hook in terms <laughs> <laughs> of being that, uh, that, that uh, you know, uh, that first out there. And mm -hmm. I like to tell that story because um, contributions by people out of the mainstream do not get the place in history that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And so I like to put it there. I like to talk about, uh, about uh, uh, major contributions by black inventors. And, and so this is how he became my favorite inventor from, from that day. Uh, not my favorite invention, but favorite inventor. Uh, could, could you talk a little bit about the electric elect, electret microphone? Electric and microphone, it, sure. Of course, um, could you like talk about the word electret, because that's not a very familiar word for most people. It wasn't familiar with me either <laughs> when I got started uh, there. Um, um, I think the best analogy for um, an electret is permanent magnet. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have a magnet, and if you have a ferromagnetic material and that comes close to a near the magnet, there is an influence. There, there's actually work that's being done uh, mm -hmm. by the either attraction or, or repulsion uh, from the magnet. Uh, what my colleague Gerhard Sessler and I were able to do was to essentially make an electrical analog of a permanent magnet. Cool. Okay, in other words, now, now you have to be careful here because uh, to say that is easy but mm -hmm. to fully explain and, and, and quantify the differences is not so easy. Uh, electromagnetism, you can do work. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, electric motors and so forth uh, can, can um, uh, generate quite a bit of energy. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, so far, the, the, the uh, electrical analog can only do a very little work. But that little work is important in many, in, in many respects. In the microphone, condenser microphones existed, in, in fact, they were invented at Bell Labs by E.C. Wente mm -hmm. as a replacement for the carbon microphone. Mm -hmm. But the condenser microphone required a very large DC bias, a few hundred volts were, mm -hmm. were, were necessary. And uh, this is because you want a, an output voltage that's proportional to the change in pressure on, on the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, uh, this large voltage made it pretty impractical from the standpoint of a telephone. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, so what we were able to do was to replace that battery with a very thin piece of, of, of polymer, mm -hmm. which we had properly treated to embed charges in that polymer so that they couldn't escape. Mm -hmm. And so it's the field that's generated from the electret that replaces 
the need for the battery, which reduces the complication of, of the uh, electra of the condenser microphone mm -hmm. and made it useful in telecommunications. You've got one on that thing. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're basically 95 to 98 percent of all microphones made in the world today are based on the principles that Sessler and I taught. So cool. it's taken over everything, including out of space. <laughs> Could you talk about any uh, difficulties slash adversity that you faced and how you overcame them just all throughout your entire uh, journey as an inventor? Well, I suppose career would be a better word. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, one of the hardest things to do is to put trash in the garbage can and to understand that to a large extent people are, are ignorant. When, when I'm walk, walking the halls of Bell Labs and somebody opens the lab door and says, I've got two burned out lights, would you? replace them. Well, when you, when things like that happen, uh, the, the, the natural instinct is to say, I'm your peer, not your servant, mm -hmm. but I learned to say, I'll be right back and just keep walking. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and the reason is because then this doesn't clutter my mind. It doesn't, doesn't hang me. I, you know, I know why he asked me. He asked me because most of the people of color who are walking the halls, that's their responsibility. Mm -hmm. They're service-oriented people. I mean, we're very heavy, even here at Hopkins, it's the same phenomena. Uh, most of the people of color that you see here are um, providing services uh, mm -hmm. for, for the rest of us. And, and so uh, when I'm confused with people of that nature, um, I, I tend or always try not to be upset, to, to, to allow it to upset me and to put it in the right pew and, and keep going. Yeah. I don't know whether that answers your question or not. No, that, that works. Yeah. What kind, of, uh, what kind of advice do you have for young, aspiring uh, inventors and engineers? We are um, in a um, very delicate position worldwide. Um, and, and no matter how you look at it, um, uh, uh, from global warming to the outright stupidity of people um, are threats to uh, the survival of the planet. Solutions to these problems are very definitely embedded in knowledge and, and what we can learn and what we can do as human beings to preserve this planet and to make it more friendly and able to provide all of what mankind needs, all mankind needs for uh, a comfortable living. We're not there. Mm -hmm. And so it's up to young people to improve our quality of life. And the major way of Im improving the quality of life is through technology. And so it is what I feel one of my duties to impress upon, upon young people not only the importance of science and technology as a career, but that it is fun. Mm -hmm. That it is uh, it, it's the best thing that I can recommend for, um, for to young people from the standpoint of being able to enjoy life, to be able to be comfortable in life, and above all to make a substantial contribution to the betterment of mankind. When you uh, consider that underrepresented minorities represent 30% uh, of the population of this country and 5% of the science, engineering, and technical workforce, when women in this country are 51 or more percent of the population, but only 15% of the science and engineering workforce, um, this, this represents a gap that we can no longer afford to support. Uh, we've we've got to get the involvement of 
underrepresented minorities and women more involved in science, engineering, and technology. We, as people, have to take charge of our children. We have to make certain that they get their lessons. We have to make certain that the teachers teach what is proper and, and correct. And, and we have to be ever vigilant of, of ourselves and of the systems to make sure that our children succeed. Okay, so. Um. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Thanks very much. Good. It's great to meet you. It's very nice to meet you too.